Good morning. I'm Vern Loeb, executive editor, and welcome to ICN Sunday Morning. You know, I spend a lot of time wondering what it's going to take to get people and politicians and society at large to take the accelerating threat of climate change seriously enough. Well, I may have a story that can do just that. In a moment, I'll be talking to Bob Berwin about that story and more. Bob is our main climate science writer, and he also covers the UN and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Because he's our only staff member who lives abroad in Austria, I think that gives him a different and unique perspective on climate change and the world, and now on how Europeans are viewing the US. Bob, thanks for joining me. Nice to be here. The piece that I mentioned uh, in my intro uh, came out of the uh, European Geosciences Union meeting that you just covered in Vienna. Um, and it's about how climate change is driving a big increase in dangerous clear air turbulence, which is invisible to pilots in, in, in cockpits, but can be very damaging to air, aircraft and, and can even injure people. Um, what causes this? It, it's definitely can get the get the attention of of people who fly a lot or, or people who fly in general. I think it's worth remembering that only eleven percent of the world's population flies on an annual basis. It's much higher in the U.S. Though I was surprised when I looked it up today. Forty four percent of Americans say they take a commercial flight once a year. So that's higher than I thought it would be. So definitely of interest to a lot of people. Um, the researchers at the conference discussed how clear air turbulence is, is caused by, by the, the jet stream and the increase is caused by changes to the jet stream uh, that are caused by global warming, by, by the way different patterns in the atmosphere shift and change. And just for short reference, the jet stream are these broad rivers of air that can be a few hundred miles wide and several thousand feet thick and they flow in kind of a wavy pattern from west to east in both hemispheres and um they're driven by the the temperature contrast between the polar areas and the mid-latitude areas where like the continents of north america and europe are and global warming is melting sea ice. It's changing the pattern of these, of these warmer and cold areas, the relative temperature difference between them. And all those things affect the jet stream, and in particular, something called uh, vertical wind shear, which is uh, a movement in the wind that one of the, the researchers likened to a waterfall in a smooth river. When a smooth river approaches a little steeper gradient, it flows faster and it starts to become turbulent. And he said, imagine a little boat floating down and as it goes over the waves, it starts to tumble and bob and so forth. And that's also what's happening in the, in the atmosphere. Yeah. It's interesting, one of the scientists you quote, um, David Ferranda, got interested in this topic when he was on a three a flight from LA to Charlotte and experienced clear air turbulence for three hours. And mm -hmm. the plane was sort of violently thrown about and luggage fell out of the overhead luggage rack. And this really traumatized him. Mm -hmm. I wish I would have asked him a little more about that specific incident because it seems like a really long period of time for that sort of turbulence to to happen and that the plane couldn't get out of it. So, um, and they actually had four case studies, but not that flight as part of their presentation where they were able to look at these four, you know, very specifically look at detailed weather models and charts and figure out the history of these flights in the hopes that they could, you know, use that information to, to give better warnings to other pilots and, and other flights. Yeah. Um, you know, as scary as the story was, and I, you know, I hate heavy turbulence when I'm flying, uh, and, and maybe it will help focus people on on threats from climate change. I don't know, but um, there was something sort of hopeful in your piece uh, about um, changes that this clear air turbulence might bring about in in mm -hmm. air travel. Right. 
Um, I, I think that's already happened to some degree, just the awareness has already grown. So people might notice who fly that you get more warnings about keeping your seatbelt on, even when everything seems perfectly calm. So the pilots are aware that this has been happening more often and they're asking people to, you know, look after their own safety. And they, they wear their seatbelts when they're in the cockpit sitting all the time too, for that same reason. Um, and, and David Ferranda said, you know, they're already looking at new types of designs for planes, for both the wings and the airframe to make them more resilient, more flexible as they plan new generations of, of planes, perhaps also with non-fossil fuel engines, you know, to make them more resilient to those types of conditions and better forecasting of these of these winds in in that are part of the jet stream to know where those conditions might happen and even be able to avoid them change the the flight path or the elevation of the flight a little bit the altitude yeah yeah the other story that you wrote coming out of that meeting in vienna was about how <laughs> the world's global scientific community is sort of rallying around american scientists now in light of the threats from the Trump administration to scientific research and, and indeed to the scientists themselves who are being laid off in droves from the US government. Uh, what kind of help are the Europeans offering the Americans? Mm -hmm. um, I wanna start by saying that there were more than 800 American scientists there. I think 880 US scientists, including some senior researchers with agencies like NASA um, who were giving presentations. And I spoke to a lot of, a lot of the, well, I spoke to a lot of, uh, to some of the American researchers, probably about 10, most of them were pretty young. And I didn't get the impression that they thought that science was going to, you know, go away completely or die out. They were enthusiastic about their work and their research. Of course, they were worried and, and concerned for some of their colleagues. But it was just a, a, a sign to me that U.S. science isn't going to go away in the next four years. It's going to change. Some of it's going to, you know, federal science is going to go away, but not all science is going away. Mm -hmm. um, from the EGU side, I think one of the most important things I heard is there's a lot of sort of personal uh, support, emotional support, compassion and empathy, which are really important qualities in, in the world these days. And, and there was some discussion of that at the panel of, hey, reach out to your, your colleagues in the U.S. if you haven't heard, heard from them in a while and uh, just see how they're doing, check out how they're doing. There's also a sense of grief. I, I know a lot of European researchers who have just spoken glowingly of time that they've spent in the field with US scientists in the forests of Colorado, for example, where I used to report, and how much they learned from the top experts uh, with, the, with federal agencies. Craig Allen, a USGS researcher, one of the leading scientists on forest mortality and climate change. And I know several European young researchers who've spent time with him and been influenced by him. Um, uh, a couple of more specific things. The EGU has set up some programs to help get research published by not just American scientists, but also scientists from other countries who face budget challenges or political challenges. So they have a portal for that. Um, also some assistance with things like attending conferences and, and making sure that, you know, research groups are open to taking new people and, and kind of, uh, deepening institutional engagement with the AGU, which is a huge, huge American counterpart to the EGU. Um, and, and then there's a separate group of scientists, mostly social scientists who are taking it a step farther and saying that if there's an emerging threat of authoritarianism in different countries in the world, they want to be prepared. So they're looking at ways to securely store platform to have secure communications, alternate distribution channels for science, sort of like a science sun is dot, which was the underground uh, communications channel in the old in the old Soviet Union. 
Yeah. Um, that's not associated with EGU, but it's also an international effort led by European scientists. And there are also a lot of European scientists working on data rescue efforts right now involving yeah. data from the US. Might we see a reverse brain drain with American scientists going to Europe to work? I, I think I think to some degree you might. And there are some efforts to entice American scientists to go to Europe. Um, you know, science has always been an international endeavor with people going both ways. Um, and budgets are tight everywhere. You know, there's a sort of a geopolitical climate right now of insecurity and concerns about conflict. And um, I think a lot of governments around the world, uh, you know, have already even voiced like, oh, yeah, if, you know, if you're an American scientist, come here. But you need to have money to back that up, too. And it's not like there's huge amounts of money flowing for science in a lot of countries. So uh, that might slow a brain drain, but I'm sure that there will be American scientists looking to relocate in other countries. Yeah. What, about the, we have. what about the national climate assessment? Um, <clears throat> Trump has pretty much fired all the scientists who are working on it in the federal government. Are we going to have a national climate assessment, which I might add is required by federal law? That's a really good question. Um, I think the answer is unclear, and I can give you a few details to that. I do also want to say that with or without a national climate assessment, we actually know really well what the climate problem is, and we also know how to solve it. Um, you know, and yes, we need to know how much worse it's going to get, how much warmer it's going to get, whether droughts will get even drier, whether heat, heat waves will get even hotter. So, you know, clearly we need research, we need national climate assessments, but also we have enough information to act now on the main problem, which is the, the release of greenhouse gas emissions yeah. from burning fossil fuels. Um, as far as what will happen to it, you know, I, th I think it hinges on will there be a legal challenge to the effort to eliminate it or will the Trump administration decide to appoint some scientists that, as has been suggested, maybe have a, a, a viewpoint that's skeptical of the, the climate consensus and try and publish a report that, uh, you know, shows things differently. I. I, I think it's too early to say exactly what's going to happen yet. And it depends a lot on, on other things that happen in the next few weeks and months. Yeah. Um, last question. What's going to happen to American scientists who have been working with the IPCC now that, you know, Trump has removed the country yet again from the whole Paris climate mm -hmm. process? Yeah. Uh, the IPCC, a lot of the work that's done is voluntary. So it doesn't necessarily require federal funding other than uh, budgets for travel in some cases for federal officials. I don't think there'll be any formal involvement. Um, but again, I'm just speculating. They may, because the U.S. is part of the United Nations, they can send people to those meetings, even if they withdraw from the Paris Agreement they can still send people there as an observer delegation. Um, and it's unclear to what level they'll, they'll participate. As far as formally, the U.S. Had, had offered previously to host one of the technical support working groups for this new round of IPCC assessments. And that involved some federal budgeting and that's already been cut. So the IPCC is looking how to handle that. Um, some other country will likely step up to, to do the support work for that technical unit. And that means providing labs and lab space and uh, tools for analysis and things like that. It's, it's really kind of a logistical part of it. Other than that, there are actually dozens of American scientists currently working with the IPCC uh, on, on different parts of that process. They're planning a special report to come out within two years. And we talked to a couple of the sci American scientists uh, working on that and uh, published a story a few months ago, pretty early on. And, and 
you know, there will be American scientists as part of this effort. They will be, the, there was a special effort to create a new portal. Previously, nominations were done through a federal government portal, a fed, federal register notice, which never happened this year. Uh, but uh, a group of universities allied to create sort of a new institutional framework for ensuring engagement. And, you know, there are American climate scientists who are really at the best in their field in the world, and their engagement would be missed. And I think every effort will be made to include them whenever possible. Yeah. So, yeah. You know, in absent a complete, I don't know, taking away passports from people or some something that we now think is absurd, but who knows what will happen in the next few years. You know, I, I foresee American scientists being part of the IPCC reports. Yeah, yeah. Bob, as ever, thank you so much for joining me. You're welcome. Yeah. And thanks to all our readers for supporting Inside Climate News and believing in the power of journalism and science in a democratic society.